me next week, along with kind of go through what are going to be the expectations for how you guys are going to do the exam. Because the exam in this class, like biomechanics, for those of you that had it before, you're going to take it once as an individual, and then you're going to take it once as a group. So from there, you guys are going to go ahead and effectively use the, uh, if you guys go to the discussion boards, you're going to see how we have the exam, and it says exam two, group member drafting, but it's really meant to be uh, exam one, but I want you guys to go ahead and from there, you're going to literally, you know, write in like, hey, you know, I'm looking for a group, and then obviously talk amongst each other of who you're going to take the exam with. Okay, so in the discussion board, you guys are going to be able to obviously figure out who's going to be taking the exam with you and take it from there. And obviously, make sure you take the exam one by yourself before you take exam two. If you try to go the other way, then congratulations, you're going to receive a zero and I'm going to be very disappointed in you. Very disappointed. Okay, so... Hold up, Dr. Lane. Uh, someone asked how big can the groups be? Uh, well, seeing as how there's only three graduate students, you can have a group of three, Alex. Sounds good. Undergrads, I'll let you guys go up to uh, groups of five because there's like 20 something of you. So the basic idea is we have groups of 12, then really we are only going to have probably one person or two or three that are really putting forth good information. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't want to work in a group. Everyone's bringing me down. So then you just do, you know, party of one. That's fine. Uh, or we will just repeat the same grade you got on the individual will be the grade you get on the group one. Or obviously you can get together with more folks. The goal is here that you have the chance to go through the information again with a partner or partners. And then from there, kind of fill in the gaps where maybe you are missing some of the information and fully understand it and make sure that you guys are going to hopefully have a better grasp and application. So chapter five, what's it all about guys? The GI system. Bingo. How we get the foodstuffs from the mouth hole through the tube into our body. And yes, part of it ends up through the other end of the tube. So we're going to talk about your digestive system. We're going to talk about the physiology behind it, the chemistry, how we're going to break down the different macronutrients to digest it, and then how we're going to go ahead and effectively pass them where they need to be. So digestion effectively starts in your mouth, not just through the fact of the mechanical change through chewing, but also we're going to be putting in saliva from our parotid glands, from our submandibular glands, and this is going to have some amylases, so enzymes that are specific to breaking down carbs. It's going to have also some lipases, so it's going to actually also help with breaking down fat. That's why if you think you're going to be able to eat or otherwise your mouth naturally waters, it's there so we can essentially get ourselves ready to start breaking things down. Now from there, we have the esophagus, which is going to be the transport between the mouth hole to the stomach. Now, Real big design flaw, food tube, air tube, same tube for a little bit. And that's how you can choke to death and obviously suffocate. So real big design flaw, but it should hopefully not be an issue. It's also meant to be one way on occasion, it's two way. And you guys know how that happens through the joys of some type of GI upset or otherwise. Now on our stomach, that's where we're gonna go ahead and be in a really acidic environment. We're gonna be dropping in pepsin. Well, it's pepsinogen, then pepsin is the active form whenever it's in an acidic environment. So it's gonna really help us break down protein, but we're also gonna be churning this food stuff over into what's known as chime. So it's in even smaller and smaller particles. So it's much more easily digested. Then we have our small intestine, which is actually going to have three different segments. The first segment of the small intestine is what's known as the duodenum. The duodenum is where you are going to be breaking down by all the different enzymes that are going to be coming in from our pancreas and our liver and then our gallbladder. It's going to be part of the storage for those uh, liver bile, which bile is very important for fat. 
breakdown, whereas our pancreatic enzymes are very important for breaking down proteins and carbs. From there, once we're in the first segment, what's known as the jejunum, that's where we're going to start to take up a lot of our carbohydrates and protein. And then later on, we get to the ileum, and that's where we're going to be taking in more of our fats, still some protein and carbohydrate. And then from there, we have the ileocecal valve, which is going to be literally the valve between you and your wonderful large intestine. Now there's the appendix, which in theory is actually useful for effectively making sure that you keep a healthy microbiome in case you have really bad uh, digestive, um, yeah, really bad type of GI infection or otherwise. And then obviously we drop it out the backside into you know the woods or obviously into a toilet. So we are also releasing huge amounts of fluid every single day as part of digestion. So we've got not just the saliva we're producing, we've got the gastric secretions inside of our stomach, we've got the bile produced by our liver, we've got all the fluid being released in our small intestine, very little in our large intestine, and that's actually where we're going to pick up most of the fluid, so we're not losing as much each day, and that's when you have diarrhea, it's effectively your large intestine isn't doing its job. And so that's why it's really easy for people to potentially die of dehydration when they have really bad uh, diarrhea or otherwise, and it's even more of a liability in little kids. So basic rundown of kind of the different structures and how they're going to be important. We're going to obviously keep going a little bit into each of these, but knowing the order of operations and how things are going to be functioning. So we are going to be regulating this GI tract through a number of different negative feedback loops through the joys of different uh, hormones and also the joys of, once again, negative feedback through sensing what's going on. So we are going to be breaking down carbs, the amylase initially in the mouth, along with chewing it. Then our stomach, the acidic environment might make it a little bit smaller, but then all of the different amylases from the pancreas are going to do real work along with the amylases that are the individual uh, sugar enzymes that happen to be lining our intestinal cells. Fats, we're going to be breaking down a little bit through the uh, salivary amylase, but then when we get ourselves into our duodenum, that's where we're gonna have bile and the bile salt specifically, that's going to emulsify it in very small micelles. And that's what's gonna be brought into those epithelial cells of our small intestine. And then with protein, we're talking about once again, really the acidic environment along with the pepsin are going to be breaking down the proteins initially. And then all of the trypsin, trypsinogens that we're getting from uh, chymotrypsin and so on that we're getting from the pancreas are gonna help us break down proteins into uh, individual amino acids, uh, dipeptides, so two amino acids and tripeptides, three. So our stomach doesn't want to really empty that quickly unless we have a huge amount of food in it. Now, when we have a lot of fat, carbs, protein, energy in general, along with osmolarity, so that'd be more amounts of salt and bigger particles, we're going to be keeping this pyloric sphincter, which is between your stomach and your duodenum closed. Because like anything else, we want to make sure that food is digested enough before it's moving on. Now, the stomach, notice, it has its body, has the fundus, which is this upper segment, and it has this antrum. Now, notice they're both secreting mucus. The key is we're getting gastrin, which is going to be a peptide that's important we'll talk about in a moment, and we're getting more of the hydrochloric acid from higher up. Now, what's really cool is you get what's known as retropulsion. So effectively, you have a band of muscle here in your stomach that'll contract and then this side of your stomach will contract and it'll shoot food back there and it mixes the food inside of your stomach while it's in there as a means to help with that breakdown. That tastes really bad. So we have a number of hormones that are very important for helping us with digestion. So gastrin being the major one that's telling our stomach to produce more hydrochloric acid. And those acidic environments can make it very easy to break down our macronutrients. We then have secretin, which is going to help our pancreas not just secrete water, but the bicarbonate. Why we care about bicarbonate? As soon as that chyme has come from our stomach into our duodenum, it's very acidic. 
And our duodenum is not built to deal with very acidic environments. So obviously bicarbonate is gonna buffer that pH and bring it up. So we're not gonna be doing damage to the inside of our intestine. Then who wants to give that uh, third one a shot when it comes to pronunciation? It's a humdinger. Come on, guys. Show those cystokinin. Uh, you're going to be required to spell this correctly on the exam, and if you spell it incorrectly, you will get no points. How's that sound? Can we just write the abbreviation? Heck yeah, please, God. Just use the acronyms, guys. But CCK is actually really important for stimulating our pancreas along with our gallbladder. So we're going to get that bile to go down through the sphincter of Odie into our duodenum. And it's telling our stomach not to let as much food go out of it. So we're going to do a better job of digesting things before they're moving on further. Now, gastric inhibitory peptide coming from the small intestine makes absolute sense. It's trying to slow down motility and secretion. We don't want food to be moving faster through our GI than our body can digest it. And obviously larger amounts of food, that's gonna make it much harder for, a or we're gonna be signaling against letting it go through too quickly. Along with glucagon-like peptide from our ileum and our colon, so we're the second or the third segment of the small intestine. The duodenum is really short compared to the jejunum and the ileum. This is gonna be important for also slowing us down. So we're gonna be able to break down things like we need to and guanolin, which is going to allow us to remove that water and our electrolytes, specifically salt, from our feces so that way we are not going to be being dehydrated. Okay, here is a list of those amylases or sorry, different enzymes, excuse me. If it's carbohydrate, you're gonna see amylase or you're gonna see the enzyme specific to the actual type of carbohydrate it's gonna break down. Whereas with lipids, notice you're gonna see lipase. And then notice when I talk about trypsin and chymotrypsin, uh, those are going to be just two of the three separate different enzymes that are going to be working on breaking down the different types of protein configurations because proteins come in more, much more wildly different arrangements than we see with fats because they're typically in triglyceride form or carbohydrates because it's going to be in the form of basic starches and fibers. We don't have the ability to break down uh, beta 1,4 linkages. Thank you, biochemistry. I still remember that. Woo. Now, when we're looking up here, guys, it's important that you're gonna see the location of which we're, we're going to be getting these enzymes being produced. But outside of the location, when we look over at the pH, notice the different types of ranges that they work well in. So looking up here, which enzymes are going to be your best bet working inside of your stomach? The ones that have a large pH. Yes, Alex. And which ones would those be? Yes, lingual lipase and pepsin. Thank you guys for putting that up in the chat. Now, pepsin is already released inside of your stomach, so it's already there. Its inactive form is what's known as pepsinogen. When it's activated, just part of that gets cleaved off just being in the acidic environment because acid breaks things down. And so we're going to notice that when we get to the actual intestine, see how we get that pH to go up a bit higher. And that's where we're going to be able to get those enzymes to function at a much better efficiency. Now, talk about the other type of valve. We talked about the appendix. So you've got this huge segment over here of our large intestine. Now, aside from extracting water and electrolytes, it's also going to be where we get a lot of the fermentation and where we're gonna be effectively absorbing uh, dietary fiber, but now it's gonna be in the form of fat because it's going to be being fermented into short chain fatty acids by the bacteria of your intestine, okay? Your large intestine is pretty darn important. Yes, you can live without it, but I don't know many people that want to be living with a coal hole for the rest of their life. If you are trying to stick to a diet, feel free to Google coal hole and you are going to be pretty disturbed pretty quickly. 
So I'd skip that. Okay. Now, we want to make sure that we're aware of how we're going to be influencing the rate at which our stomach is going to empty different foods. And osmolarity is going to influence that. And that's effectively the amount of sodium, chloride, potassium, different electrolytes, and also carbohydrates, et cetera, that you're gonna find inside of it. So if we have a lower osmolarity, it's gonna be much more rapidly absorbed. If we have a higher osmolarity, it's actually going to be much uh, higher or much harder to take in. Now, this is just the osmolarity of a couple different beverages. These, uh, Lucozade and otherwise, that is a type of uh, carbohydrate uh, sport beverage along with Isostar that sold over in the UK because Yukundrup is actually, uh, he's initially out of Europe. And then just like our osmolarity, whenever we've done old school chemistry, water is gonna go from high or be pulled from low to high to essentially make sure that you're diffusing the concentration. So the concentration gradients are gonna be pretty equal. So hence, when we're really trying to go and rehydrate, we wanna make sure that we're not using something that happens to be too high of osmolarity. We're gonna get into this more with the actual hydration chapter, but it's important in that this is gonna influence how quickly our stomach empties. And this becomes more of a math problem when we're dealing with certain athletes and certain types of considerations of how we're gonna get the calories in them at a rate, the rate at which the body can actually absorb and not have them feel nauseous and sick all the time. So speaking of absorbing, carbs are gonna be broken down into the simplest forms, which is gonna be effectively galactose, glucose, and fructose. And then on occasion, you know, we'll ribose and lactate, but those are pretty rare. Fats are gonna be broken down into those individual fatty acids and the glycerol into micelles. Amino acids, once again, as an amino acid, uh, di and tripeptides. Water just simply goes through membranes. Carbs and amino acids both use transporters. Fats are going to be absorbed through those micelles, so they actually kind of fuse with the cell membrane. And minerals also are going to use transporters to go through, and some of them are actually going to be competitive with one another, which we'll get into more with the minerals chapter. Now, how we're able to get so much digestion with a relatively short GI tract is because it has a huge amount of layers. So what we find is if we're looking at a small amount of a small intestine, ah, 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 okay, we're going to have all of these individual folds, which those folds in turn have individual folds and those individual folds have the villi. And then notice the villi have their micro villi. So these are the actual cells that make up that brush border of your GI. And they are going to be where we're getting all of the nutrients to come into the body. And they're mostly all from there going to be actually kind of, uh, shall we say, received by the liver before they're gonna really go out to full circulation throughout your bloodstream for where it's gonna do anything else it's gonna be doing with your health. So this gives what would otherwise be relatively small to a huge, huge amount of real estate. So we're gonna be able to do a good job of, of, of absorbing everything we happen to be eating. And once again, guys, if you don't see it in a toilet the second time, you absorbed it, it is now part of you. So, oh, we can, no, I'm not gonna go that way, that's a little too dark. Okay, so this is the breakdown of carbohydrates. So we have initially these starches, with the notice alpha 1,4 bonds, that's how we get the daisy chain together. Every kink you see in it, that's from an alpha 1,6 linkage. Now, from there, the amylase is gonna break it down into a shorter oligosaccharide, uh, maltriose, which then would be active or would then be enzymatically broken down from maltose by maltase into glucose. Notice lactose is separating one glucose and one galactose, and that's the type of sugar you're gonna find in dairy. Uh, sucrose is more the table sugar, which can be made up of a combination of one glucose and one fructose. And then, yeah, once again, the maltose. Now notice guys, glucose and galactose use their own transporter with a symporter of sodium. So it literally takes sodium to help get it into the cell. And in turn, notice how you asked me about the GLUT2 receptors, Alex, there you go. Now, whereas fructose is actually going to be the GLUT5 receptor. Now this is the one that allows fructose to go through that epithelial cell into the capillary and now into the bloodstream. Now, this gives us some pretty interesting pieces in that one, 
now we can see the importance of using effectively more than one source of carbohydrate. So if you're really working with an athlete that's trying to compete and we're trying to reload carbohydrates rapidly between games on a tournament day or otherwise, utilizing a carbohydrate beverage that has not just glucose in it, but also fructose is going to allow them to take in more because at some point you're going to max out how many receptors you have per hour and you're not going to be able to get any more carbs than that. Now, those guys, it's per hour. You're going to be able to absorb far more carbohydrates if you simply just chill out because who cares? You've got plenty of time to do it. I think it's usually about 1.6 grams per minute is probably kind of the amount you can really absorb if you're working out with any intensity. But you do have, like anything else, a limit on how much you're going to be able to tolerate without getting into some GI disturbances, which we're going to touch on at the end here. Raquan, do you have a question? You're unmuted, bud. We've been pe uh, picking up a little background folks. He does not have a question and that is okay. So proteins are a little bit more interesting how they're gonna be enzymatically broken down. In that, notice guys how proteins are gonna be a combination of a lot of different individual amino acids. These different individual amino acids in turn are going to be broken down into, notice those tripeptides. Now, some tripeptides can actually go through transporters into the intestinal cells where they're gonna be broken down into their individual amino acids and then go throughout your bloodstream. Whereas the trypsin, chymotrypsin, carbo, uh, carboxypeptidase are going to take and break down those tripeptides into dipeptides and individual amino acids, which in turn are going to once again go into circulation. Notice again, guys, sodium is an important component of getting those amino acids into our cells, aside from the transporters we're going to have for the individual dye and tripeptides. Now, once those happen to be inside of those epithelial cells, the individual amino acids are going to go ahead and be transported into the capillaries. And that's what's going to be effectively kind of processed by the liver to a certain extent, and then put into wonderful circulation. So when we absorb fats, just like you're going to see fat at the top of a bottle of um, olive oil and vinegar when you don't shake it, that's initially how it comes in. Now, what biles do is they emulsify those fats into very, very small droplets. So it's effectively just going to be a combination of individual fatty acids all facing out from the center. That in turn is going to be what's absorbed in through your cells through the microvilli. So what you're going to see is they're actually going to come through. We do have fatty acid transporters. Now, once we're inside of those epithelial cells, now we're going to go ahead and essentially put them all together into apolipoproteins with also phospholipids, AKA we're going to be making them into, when we talk about high density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins, that is literally what these are made up of after our initial stage of being what is a chylomicron, which is a massive one, which is gonna go through our circulation. Medium chain triglycerides have slightly different properties because they're smaller, that they in turn are gonna go straight into the bloodstream. Long chains, that's why we need to go with my cells. Now, vitamins are pretty interesting in that different vitamins are going to be absorbed in different locations. And notice guys, some of these are going to need a specific help so that they're going to be able to be absorbed. And B12 is one of them because your body's ability to produce intrinsic factor as you get older actually is gonna go down. And because of that, we're going to potentially have some issues with B12. And that's why some folks uh, do injections and otherwise. And that's actually going to be uh, taken up inside of the ileum, which remember it is going to be the more distal part of our small intestine. Questions here? I feel like I'm sprinting through things. Okay. Now, let's talk about how gross y'all are. Now, we do have a really good interview with um, uh, Gabriella Fondero that you guys are going to be able to listen to from last semester when she talked about the joys of the microbiome. That's going to be something you guys are going to watch later on in the semester. But we're going to introduce the basic concept here, which is you got a lot of bacteria all over you. Now, your stomach has relatively low amounts of bacteria just because of the very acidic environment inside of it. Whereas as we go from that first part of our small intestine to the end, and then finally to our colon, we're going to see massively, massively higher numbers of 
bacteria in those regions. And that's not a bad thing. Those bacteria are going to be creating things for us, different types of sources of fuels we're gonna use from short chain fatty acids. They're gonna be providing a certain amounts of vitamins and minerals, or uh, more vitamins, specifically vitamin K is going to typically be something that's being produced by our wonderful bacteria inside of our intestines. And so it's important that we have a pretty good diversity of the microbiome, along with not just a good diversity, but a certain amount of them. So we do want to actually have enough bacteria and appropriate numbers of each as we go throughout our systems. So the last thing that we have, which we're going to go ahead and have you guys work in groups, which is going to be what are some of the causes that we're going to see with uh, GI issues, both during and after exercise. So why is it that some folks are going to have issues with trying to eat while they're working out? Why are some folks going to have issues with trying to eat after they get done working out? So group one, you guys are going to be in charge of breaking down some of the physiological causes of GI issues. And please feel free to use your text for this, guys. Group two, you guys are going to talk about mechanical issues with GI issues, both during and potentially after exercise. And then finally, group three, you're going to be talking about nutritional causes. Now, when we say physiological, now we're talking about blood supply to the area, hint, hint. Mechanical, we're talking about the actual motion of the body and how that can give us issues, hint, hint. And then finally, nutritional is going to come down to maybe perhaps not being able to absorb everything we're taking in all at once, hint, hint. So go ahead, folks. It is currently 627. We're going to give you guys until 35 uh, for you guys to go ahead and work in those groups obviously have fun and then be ready to paste in the chat or talk through with a group what you guys came up with. So whenever you're ready, the rooms are open and give it some go. Yeah, so that's a solid job of breaking down the mechanical side. Forgot to record, so I'm just repeating myself. But yes, the jostling of running the being bent over when you're cycling. Also, if you have a big enough meal and you're in an arrow, like so you're really bent over when you're cycling, your thighs will hit your chest a little bit and that can be uh, uncomfortable to say the least. And yes, okay. Physiological, yes, because when you're working out harder, you're gonna have less blood flow going to the area, which can go into ischemia, which in turn is going to cause potentially some issues and yes, lead to some diarrhea. And then, yes, when it comes to nutritional, you can have issues with dairy. NSAIDs are a major issue when using too much of them. And then this is where you kind of see like FODMAP diets and otherwise, where some folks can have some major issues just because of, yeah, their GI just doesn't do well certain types of fiber or high levels of certain types of macronutrients. So that lends itself to the uh, final part of the chapter slides, which we're still going to talk about a few more things, which is going to be really how we prevent these things. Well, First and foremost is don't be soft, no I'm kidding. Uh, it's planned appropriately. So making sure that we're not doing a large meal before we're trying to work out. And we're if we are gonna go ahead and take in some calories while we're working out, it's gonna be something light, something simple, something very easy to digest. So we're avoiding fiber, we're being mindful of how much fructose, and then we're do, not doing a large volume of food. And we wanna make sure we prepare ourselves. We wanna make sure that we, once again, bring things that our body we know can tolerate. We won't, don't wanna get fancy and eating exotically the night before a big competition or tournament, something we care about. Instead, eat what we know the body tolerates well and is gonna allow us to perform well. So with that being said, when we're going through and you're looking at the digestion, you're thinking about the different enzymes, you're thinking about what are gonna be the important of different parts of the GI, Keep in mind also, guys, we need those receptors. And that's where we're going to be able to take in the nutrient because we have the receptors for those amino acids. We have the receptors for those carbohydrates and fats obviously are a different case. But we, if we don't have those receptors, we can't take them in. And there's only so many of those receptors. So hence, when we're exercising, you can't eat. If you're exercising at a high enough intensity, you don't have that much blood flow going to your GI in the first place. And you're going to have a real hard time with trying to break down those nutrients and get them into your bloodstream and then obviously to those muscles. So we wanna make sure that we're not taking things uh, too far and making things effectively be too brutal on an individual for how they would try and go and perform. So the next thing we're gonna go ahead and have you guys do, and we're gonna create some, we're gonna go ahead and go four rooms. So you guys can go ahead and do this together. 
uh, with um, different individuals than you did before, because this is going to be breaking up, is I want to introduce the basic concept of what's known as discretionary calories. So discretionary calories are going to be calories that effectively you can do whatever you want with. And remember, if we're trying to Oh, remember uh, medium chain triglycerides are going to go straight through the cellular membranes when it comes to fats for absorption. So you don't have to worry about a receptor. And then fats are going to be brought into those mice cells, which can then obviously just go with the wall or specifically with the transporter that's going to effectively haul them into those intestinal cells. So they're a little different because they're effectively in clumps is how we get fats in, as opposed to with amino acids and carbohydrates where we're trying to get them into their singular form for the most part. And sodium is usually pretty important for getting into the cells. So discretionary calories are the calories that after you've done the basics of what you need every day, you can do whatever you want. So you guys are going to go ahead and take your previous uh, BMR that you have, or sorry, yes, we're, we're talking about the total calories you burn each day. Then you need to take in 1.5 grams per kilogram of your body mass of protein, 0.5 grams per kilogram of body mass of fat, and then finally, three grams per kilogram of body mass of carbohydrate. So there's going to be obviously three of you guys in a group. Okay. So you guys have that. That is the basics. Calories you need. And this would be for someone that's resistance training and is doing a decent amount of volume or doing a little bit of volume and wants to maintain their muscle mass at bare minimum. Okay. From there, one of you is going to be in a 500 calorie surplus, okay, over that BMR, because with the goal would be to try to gain weight, one of you is 500 calorie deficit because you're trying to lose weight. And then the final teammate is simply getting in their maintenance. So what you're going to have is you're going to have so let's take me for example. Let's say that I burn 3,000 calories a day through physical exercise and everything else. So I weigh about 95 kilos. So that means I take that 95 kilograms, multiply it by three. Let's just say I'm 100 kilograms so we can make this math real easy, okay? So that's going to be 300 grams of carbohydrate per day, which is going to give me 1,200 calories. I'm taking in... 1.5 grams of protein for that kilogram of body mass. So that's going to give me 150 grams of protein. And we're going to now need that is going to give me another 600 calories or up to 1800 calories. And then finally, I've got 0.5 grams of fat per kilogram of body mass. So that's going to be a grand total of 50 grams of fat. So that's 450 calories. So now I'm up to a grand total of 2,250 calories per day. And that's just basic. But then that gives me my discretionary calories, which is going to be 750 calories just to maintain my body weight. I could do 750 calories of straight up butter if I wanted. And that's going to be obviously combing fat. I could do 750 calories of pixie sticks, or I could do 750 calories of plain sad chicken. And so I've got options of what I can do with those leftover calories. So my goal with you guys is not only you're going to say like, okay, I had this many discretionary calories. Okay. And if you're in that caloric deficit, so notice from my example, if I was in the deficit, that only give me 250 calories left over. That's not a lot. Whereas if I was trying to gain weight, that would give me a caloric surplus of now we're talking about 1,250 calories. So I could go and have me like a double quarter pounder with cheese for my uh, discretionary calories. So you're going to go ahead and look at, figure out, okay, with those discretionary calories, what would that be? And what would I want that to be made up of? So any questions, comments, concerns before we send you guys into the individual rooms again, mm -hmm. to kind of start working your way through this.
Questions, comments, concerns? So for our discretionary calories, we're supposed to, are we supposed to say like what we would eat in those discretionary calories or what was- Yeah, exactly. So let's say you okay. got um, an extra 500 calories. So you're gonna just um, make it easy on yourself and say you're gonna do five 100 calorie packs of Oreo mini whatever nonsense. Okay, cool, there you go. Does that make sense? So trying to figure out like, okay, what would that actually be if I had an extra 100 calories a day? Like, okay, I'd eat an apple. A really big apple, a really big apple, okay? Or like, yeah, I've got the 1,000 calories, like, yeah, I'm gonna go enjoy a giant plate of French fries or something along those lines. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does, thanks. Yeah, yeah, so it's more or less kind of getting people to think about what they're really doing. So the real long arc here, guys, the idea is, remember, the thing that's pushing your body weight is literally calories into calories out. If you're taking in more calories than you're burning, you're gonna gain weight. If you're burning more calories than you're taking in, you're going to lose weight. But within that, it doesn't mean we need to eat nothing but sad plates of broccoli, chicken, and rice. Instead, it means, okay, we're going to eat a diet where we're getting in the macros that we really need to maintain our performance. But then after that, let's have fun. If you got the extra calories left over and you want to do your extra calories in Ho-Hos and Twinkies, more power to you. Now, do I think that's a great long-term strategy? No. But if that one, I don't know, uh, fun size, which we all know is a fucking lie. Like that's not a fun size when it's like that with a Snickers bar or something. But if that's what gets you through the diet is you get to have one of those every night, then you know what? Do it to it. I'm not going to yuck some he's young. And there's my giant dog drinking in the background in case you're wondering what that really loud uh, slapping noise was because Norbert. All right. So you guys are going to have new groups, have fun with your groups, talk your way through it and help each other out. It's 647. Plan on being ready before 655 with how many calories you would have that would be discretionary and then what you would choose to take it in in the form of, okay? And remember, one of you guys picks the caloric surplus, one of you picks the deficit, and one of you guys picks a balance. Have fun with it. All right, folks, so when you guys are ready, go ahead and put up in the chat effectively how many discretionary calories that would have given you guys and what that example would have meant. Like what, what would that really have turned out to be? Not bad, Nathan. Not bad. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad surplus to have there, John. Oh, God. You guys really, uh, you guys know how to live on your discretionary calories. And that is a wide variety of thing, uh, Kristen. I think you're got a little bit better self-control because I think a lot of people could easily do a thousand calories of ice cream. Uh -huh. That's not, it's not outside of the gamut of possibility. I didn't say you had to do it in five minutes. You can take your time. Okay. Okay, Jackson. So... Well, that's okay. That's okay. It, it was obviously it's an involves uh, breakdown that we're looking to do this evening. So the basic idea, and I uh, talked with one of the groups because they were also having issues getting through everything, which is you find out 
for some folks, especially if you're trying to lose weight, after you hit those like basics of this much protein, this much carbs, and this much fat, you don't really have many leftover calories. So congratulations, like you need to keep it pretty simple and keep it pretty clean because you don't get options. Whereas obviously if you're trying to gain weight, that's where you can have some fun because it's like, oh God, I need to take an extra thousand calories. Huh? What do I want to get that from? So obviously in John's example, he obviously decided to go to McDonald's. Raquan decided to go to Krispy Kreme. I noticed that nobody was like, I was going to eat 20 pounds of broccoli. So I would have all those calories I need. So it's meant to be obviously quite involved. Nice, Haley. Yeah, where, yeah, throw on a Hershey bar and some, and a sandwich, like that doesn't sound like a bad fate. It's obviously not the most uh, massive discretion, but therein lies the simple reality. If people are trying to lose weight, they typically need to keep things a lot tighter. It's when you're trying to gain weight, that's when you can have a lot more fun. And that's, once again, where we get to the basic concept of discretionary calories. And the reality is we're going to learn further on in this class how much protein we're getting in is going to be very important and how much carbohydrate we're getting in when we happen to be doing aerobic style work or things that happen to stress that glycolytic, both aerobic and anaerobic systems, because if we don't get enough carbs, we're not gonna be able to keep up a work output, can't keep up a work output or exercises and our performance is going to suffer and so on and so forth. So we might have certain athletes that are trying to lose weight and they're pretty much eating nothing but protein and carbohydrates with just a little bit of fat so they can hit their basics. Four gummy bears. Wow, Katie, that looks sad, but that's that great example. And, or you could do the sugar-free gummy bears, but then be careful, uh, they can be very potent laxative if you do too many. Nice, nice. Of course, I would only expect that Alexander, as a typical millennial, would need his avocado toast. <laughs> which is funny, by birth year, I'm technically considered a millennial, which is, oh God, it hurts my heart to say it out loud. Yep, too many darn, not, not inequality of wealth or weight <laughs> or economics, it's just because you eat too much avocado toast. I love it when we make complex as, uh, issues and make them be simple. Okay, so 1,300 calories of hitting Taco Bell. What does that mean to you, Tori? Uh, just go all out. Just go all out. I, I think your all out is nowhere near as severe and disturbing as probably my all out back in the day. So I'm always intrigued to know what that means. Like a crunch wrap supreme. Okay, I like I'm gonna go all out. I'm gonna have one. Like. There was nights where we would see if we could, if each of us could do like the 10 soft tacos on our own type thing. Cause we were eating for a family of four individually. But anyways, that's, uh, that's the stupid things that I used to do to my GI. And we're not here to talk about that. Okay. The last activity that we're going to do guys is we're going to randomize you guys into groups again. Okay. So we're going to allow you guys to go ahead and, you know, work with some different people and you guys are going to now Groups one and two, you guys are going to be looking at irritable bowel syndrome. Group two is going to be looking at Crohn's. So if you guys have a disease, I want you guys to effectively talk about what causes it. And that is going to be a real son of a gun to explain. Okay. How are they managed? What do you do nutritionally? What are the things you're avoiding? What's that work with? And effectively, what does that disease really do to someone's digestive tract, to their health, wellness, and performance? Then for groups three and four, you guys are going to be looking at what happens when we have to reset, so remove parts of the GI. So what happens when we remove part of the jejunum? What happens when we remove the large intestine? How does this change their quality of life? What, how does it change their nutrition? What else is going on? Are there potential reasons for having to do this? And they actually can sometimes be linked with one and two. Now, it's 7.07 now. We're just going to give you guys about five minutes to just break down and answer those questions and throw them up in the chat. Once again, you're going to be working in, in those groups. And then after that, we are strictly going to be reviewing. But it's important because it's likely that you guys know someone or you're going to meet someone and work with someone that has IBS or Crohn's. And 
if you, we understand what happens if we remove part of the digestive tract, then we get a pretty good idea of, okay, here's the things we need to do. Now you can remove a gallbladder and people are gonna be fine, doesn't really change up their life too much, might have some issues with fat digestion on occasion and steatorrhea, which is fat in your stool, you'll see oil at the top. It, it happens on occasion, but thankfully it isn't too frequent. Whereas when we're talking about resections, that's pretty rare because like anything else, if your stomach quits working, your pancreas quits working, typically you don't live. So we don't really worry about the same thing with the liver, but you can get away with missing certain parts of your GI and technically you can miss all of it and do total peripheral nutrition, which is you get all of your nutrition through IVs, but that is not a high quality of life. So we're not going to worry about that, but have fun guys. It's 7 08 because I talk too much. So let's come on, plan on coming back at 7 13. Whenever you guys are ready, go and hop in those groups, start breaking it down and really making sure you answer each of those questions specific for your group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good job, Haley's group. Good. Along with you might have some issues with certain vitamin and mineral absorption, but usually the other parts of your digestive tract is usually pretty good. Oh, Abby, nice job on your additions. I'm seeing that now. Very nice. And yes, uh, Katie, good work. And that is the truth. It's interesting that obviously it's an inflammation of the bowel that's pretty brutal and hard on the individual, but it's still not something that's been fully mechanistically understood as far as what really causes this to occur and why we have these kind of you know, long-term negative health effects from individuals that unfortunately happen to be stricken with it. So good work, guys. So last thing we're going to go ahead and do is, so here's just the wonderful discussion board. So I'm moving around so I can see what I'm doing. So you can see where you can put in your um, exam group members, but then also reviews questions that you guys have. So uh, we will hopefully have some more guest speakers coming. I don't have any currently scheduled, but when I do, this is also the tab where you guys are going to go and write that in and I'll do a better job of letting you know that they're coming in the future. So in the interim, now is your guys's review. So go ahead and put in the chat, anything you guys want me to go ahead and talk about as far as when it comes to your exam, it exists, it has multiple questions. Some of them are gonna be multiple choice. Some are gonna be short answer. Some are gonna be matching. Uh, mostly you're gonna see a lot of short answer. The exam is over chapters one through five along with the additional work that we've done in groups. Uh, I believe questions, it's like 23 to 25. You've got an hour and 15 after you take it as an individual, then you're gonna go ahead and take it as a group. So the key is, you know, you just need to make sure you start the exam before that final date. And then obviously you can take the exam as a group. You guys can all do it on Thursday night of next week instead of in class time for obvious scheduling issue, uh, reasons, or you can take it at your leisure. As I'm sure there's a number of folks that aren't here tonight because things be crazy right now. Maybe they got called into work. Maybe their internet's not working at home. There's, yeah, some great weather we're having out there, guys. Some great weather. Any other questions you guys can think of right now that you guys would like me to go ahead and cover and talk through? So athletes in general are typically going to require more carbohydrates and or protein. It's not necessarily going to be everything. The fat demands might not actually be that different. Vitamin and mineral demands might also be higher, especially when we're talking about your female athletes that are doing a lot of endurance training where we're gonna have much higher iron demands than we'd normally see, but a lot of your other vitamins and minerals shouldn't be too, uh, too much higher. Uh, maybe and uh, more electrolytes just because you're sweating more and then potentially more magnesium.
Uh, well, obviously preferences when it comes, oh, sorry, things you should consider. Uh, preferences for foods and food sources along with timing and how it best fits their life. And also, you know, considering what are their overarching goals? Are they playing the sport because they want to be the best at it? Or are they playing this sport because they enjoy it, but they still want to be healthy? Because if you're playing a sport that you enjoy, but you still want to be healthy, it's going to very much so change your approach than if your goal is just to be the best. If it's to be the best, then we're willing to do some things that we know are going to be sacrificing long-term health so we can get better performance. Um, yeah, the exam itself, once you click start, you should have about 75 minutes to take it as an individual. It might be 90. It'll tell you when you start how many minutes you have. It's at least 75. It would not be over 90. What other questions would you guys like to review? Uh, yes, so energy balance is gonna be important, not just for muscle recovery when it comes to glycogen, but remember that protein that we're gonna be taking in along with other calories in general to allow for those muscles to resynthesize more actin, myosin, and all of the other uh, proteins structural that are needed to allow that muscle to work appropriately. So yeah, the total amount of calories you are taking in is going to influence your recovery along with the macronutrient distribution. You can survive a lot more when you happen to be on a caloric uh, surplus. When you happen to be on a caloric deficit, you gotta be a lot more careful and it's a lot easier to get yourself into situations simply because your body doesn't have extra reserves that it can just do whatever it wants with. And uh, for you guys, for that discussion board with the review stuff, I will check that uh, tomorrow and uh, Monday, and I'll just try to shoot like a little video answer to any of your questions. But remember the big components of each chapter of kind of when we talked about what effectively how we determine needs, how we're going to look at tolerable upper limits of intake along with the RDA, how we're going to be looking at everything that's going into caloric balance. So the calories in, calories out and understanding how also they're going to be influencing one another. So when we're trying to gain weight, we're gonna be burning more calories through the thermic effect of food, potentially having meat go up as well, which makes it harder to gain weight. And then on the antithesis is true. When we're trying to lose weight, it can be harder because we're taking less food. We've got a lower thermic effect food and we are going to be fidgeting less so our needs gonna go down. So they can kind of be come essentially some different variables that are gonna be resistive to us trying to make the changes that we're obviously at least intending to do. Um, make sure that you guys are obviously going through digestion, how we're going to look at energetic needs, how we're going to look at basic essential ways of reading labels and making sure that we understand what we're taking in in the first place. So a lot, a lot of fun stuff, a lot of fun stuff. Plus we got to talk with Greg, that was a good time. So can you got any you guys have any more questions that you guys want? Yeah, no worries. Which uh, macronutrient is the least likely cause fatigue in athletes is protein. Uh, it's highly unlikely that you ever run out of protein. Don't be sorry. We're, we're here to learn guys. And I don't like sitting in a room talking to myself. It feels very uh, weird. I'd rather be talking to you guys and be doing it in person, but uh, A, we got a lot of snow on the ground outside and B, it's a pandemic. Well, I guess it's not a lot for, uh, for our Canadian here. They're probably a little bit more used to it, but the rest of us, this is uh, probably a little bit more than most folks are having stay down on the ground for more than one day. Hmm, interesting, learn something new. Dr. Lane, I wanted to talk about, um, so if you look at slide 10 and slide 11, when we're talking about the, um, the way your body breaks down like glucose and protein uh, through the epithelium, you were talking about in the, the voice lectures about the use of ATP and how in protein digestion, you need ATP, but in for like carbohydrate digestion, you don't need ATP. So I was just kind of like confused because on the diagram, it shows that 
ATP is required. I don't know if the ATP is not required only for fructose. Okay. So now that's a great uh, question to bring up, Bob. The key is more along the lines of think about how extensively the energy demands are effectively to get this into the cell. So where you're using sodium as a symporter, just like you are going and using this whenever it comes to amino acids. But the key is with the breakdown here, it's not so much that it uses ATP as enzym enzymatically, it requires a lot more enzymes to be produced to go ahead and effectually function to break all the different types of linkages that you're gonna have from one amino acid to the other because you need a wider variety as opposed to carbohydrates where you just have two different types and they'll take care of all the business here that you need. Got it, that makes sense, thank you. Yeah, no worries. But a big thing to, to bring up, which I'm glad you, uh, you brought us back here is remember guys, how sodium is important. So that's why you'll see sodium added to Gatorade and other products as a means to giving us effectively that uh, electrolyte we need to act as a symporter, meaning they both go in the cell at the same time. And then it's actually the ATP is used to pump that sodium back out so we can go ahead and have this. So if you have enough sodium available, you don't need to even worry about it. Whereas with our uh, amino acids, we find ourselves in pretty much the same type of predicament. So arguably it's cheaper energetically to take in protein or carbohydrates if we happen to be doing so in conjunction with taking in sodium. Any other questions you guys wanna cover or you guys feel pretty good, feel relatively ready? And like I said, just go ahead and put up any questions you guys have for the review. I'll try to check it on Tuesday, at, at least Tuesday by the end of the day and put up a little video um, on the YouTubes or something that you guys can link up to. Yeah, no worries. Your paper, when you guys write that up in your review of the original article is probably going to be somewhere around just the writing part of it, not like a title page and everything else, at least two, if not three pages. Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, folks. So, well, without further ado then, you guys have a great night. Study hard for the exam. Make sure you remember we're not gonna meet here. You guys are just gonna take the exam. That's all you gotta do next week. And then we will be back in lecture, obviously the following Thursday. So stay safe out there, guys. Take care of yourselves. And I will talk with you guys all more soon. So bye-bye.